note carry on baggage restrictions or luggage I knowledge should be restrained securely in the head locker well before takeoff all gliders can do circuits but it's not the only thing that they are designed to do why go to Cisteron well here we are 10,700 climbing at something like seven knots Summary. <coughs> Cloud structures, the P-flow experiments, Rayleigh number, the misleading one-knot thermal, the vortex toy, weak average and strong thermal differences, the structure of column thermals. Is this advanced training at your club? Bored with flying solo circuits and bumps and hosting visiting guests. Desperate to learn to fly cross country yet this appears to be the club's meaning of advanced training. Still not flying with the Eagles. You have an option. BJ shop or me at my email address. The toroidal vortex. Troidal vertex, if we had a bucket, a bucket of air, and we try and push it in your general direction, nothing would happen. You wouldn't feel the effects of that air at all because it just doesn't move. Let's look at cloud rotation. What you're seeing and what your brain believes can sometimes be somewhat different. If you look at any black spot, you get the impression, the visual illusion that the other circles are going around. Actually, there is no movement whatsoever on this slide. It is normal to see that, by the way. Individual structures then. Perception is that this is what is occurring. The reality is a strong outflow at the top and a weak inflow towards the bottom. So it's more akin to this kind of shape. Again the perception, laminar acceleration here. The reality is they are very quickly form a collection of cells. So here we have the laminar acceleration at the bottom and we can see the five independent individual cells that are actually climbing up from this fire. So, and it will continue to climb like this with the cells flows being sympathetic to each other, not interfering with each other. So there's one cell, there's another cell, a third, a fourth at the back there, and there's the fifth. Thermal size end. The bubbles are around 200 meters across. So here's a little cloud. And what it's actually made up of is three vortices in this example. If we look at a bigger cloud, it's made up of numerous vortices. So far you'll see they've not included the full toroidal smoke ring vortex. In reality, nearly all useful thermals establish this rotating motion caused by the central air accelerating upwards and an outflow of the descending air running around it, without which they would have no rotational driving force or rigidity and break apart. The vortex owes its rigidity to being a two-dimensional gyro. So we are actually toroidal vortex air force chasers and racers, or the Royal Toroidal Air Force. What actually generates the vortex flow? Well there we've seen this example of how the vortex forms. And the sinking air, the air that is above the vortex as it climbs up, descends around the outside. And that keeps the acceleration of the downward flow of the vortex going. The rotation is generated by the interaction at the top between the cold air running around the rising bubble, which can be seen at the top of any active cumulus. 
Revision then of physics, cloud base and thermal strength. 10 degree temperature difference between forecast min and max temperature. So in this example of 10 degrees, we have a cloud base of 4,000 feet and the thermal strength becomes 3.8 knots. Rayleigh's number then. Why does that all happen? Well, the strength is dependent on the drop. So here we have a column of water with a tank with holes in it. Now we can rapidly see that the further it falls, the greater the pressure, the greater the flow of water out of the bottom of the barrel compared to the top. The same applies to operating bands, including cloud heights, not to go below the operating band. So in the middle of the screen, we got a 5,000 foot operating band which gives us five knots. A little bit later on thermals go higher but they start a little bit higher. So again we've got 6,000 feet of drop there from the inversion so we've got six knot thermals. The P experiment. No this isn't a prostrate check. Before I show you the videos we'll just have some words about it then. So place a glass in the washing up bowl and fill with water. Turn the tap on so that there is a continuous stream of water pouring into the middle of the glass and allow it to continuously overflow. Throw some frozen peas into the glass or for that matter could be frozen sweet corn. You might expect them to follow the flow pattern of figure one which I'm going to show you and leave the glass. Instead, they follow the flow pattern of figure two and indicate the toroidal vortex at the bottom. If you increase the flow rate, the vortex remains the same width but grows vertically up the glass. If you reduce the flow, you will observe that at a specific flow rate, the vortex collapses. This will give you a clear, real visual concept of thermals. You'll also note that the flow outwards at the bottom of the glass is faster than the flow back towards the centre higher up, rather like the flow of air through a hairdryer. If we simply turn up to upturn what we see, we then have a clear idea of what we're trying to find and centre on whilst thermaling, although we can't see it. We know the shape of the leading edge of the vortex because of the shape of the top of cumulus cell clouds caused by interference drag. So here's my bowl which is the shape of the top of a thermal. Here's my washing up bowl and I'm going to put both of these in the kitchen sink. Flow of water poured into a glass. Simple anticipated flow which is correct for a slow flow. And that's exactly what we would expect. The reality though that if we increase the flow rate to a faster flow we end up with a vortex at the bottom of the glass. And this is going on quite happily. So here we have the washing up bowl in the sink and inside a bowl. Notice the peas stay essentially within the vortex. There's clearly a continual flow of water out of the washing up bowl as well. Of course the odd pea will escape And we know there's a central flow there. As soon as we turn that flow off, everything stops. Turn it on quickly. They still, hardly any peas escape from the vortex. They stay within the vortex. Although they're more dense in the water, you'd expect them to flow outwards. I'm now going to interrupt one edge of this vortex. And what I want you to notice is the 
top right hand corner although I'm going to interrupt the flow on the bottom left the top right you'll see all of a sudden completely breaks down as well so any interference on this vortex whatsoever will have a big effect on the whole of the vortex which is why there are no vortexes on the side of mountains so on the left then we have the often simple flow of a thermal as it was much early in episode one and we see this kind of a flow going on the reality is this kind of a flow over here on the right if it's slow it's a shallow vortex if it's fast it's a deeper vortex so if our friend says there's six knots ahead come and join me go you'll probably connect if it's two knots <clears throat> I'll stay where you are looking at a greater picture then here we have the goldfish bowl we know the shape of the cloud at the bottom we know the approximate shape of the vortex and so again we'll have a look at this we lower the flow we can see water is continuously pouring out of the top and the depth of the vortex is considerably shallower than it was. If we reduce the flow a little bit further, we then get below Rayleigh's number. So although there is a flow of water, there is no vortex. Increase the flow to a high flow and the vortex re-establishes itself straight away. And because it's a higher flow, it's deeper. For thermal orientation, tip your head upside down and watch the video again. And no peas felt pain in this experiment. Beer glass and a ping pong ball. Consider, if we have a beer glass full of water on a ping pong ball, we push our finger to the bottom push the ping pong ball to the bottom and let go obviously we know the ball will spring straight up because of buoyancy but imagine for a moment if we push the ball to the bottom of the glass and now drop the glass what will happen to the ping pong ball actually it'll stay where it is relative to the glass because the whole of it has become weightless now this is important when our glider hits sink because the glider is sinking, it's heading, the, heading in the direction of gravity. As soon as we hit sink, the glider will immediately go down. There is no Tom and Jerry delay on the instrumentation. So actually, the variometer is not a bad indicator that we're encountering worse air. And that's the same for if the thermal is going from six knots up to four knots up, we are encountering worse air. There will be very little delay or lag in the instrumentation to the real world which is quite the opposite for uh, indicating a rate of climb where the thermal and rising air uh, must get the glider to overcome its rate of descent first before it indicates a climb. And that's often what we call lag. The Rayleigh-Bernard instability, thermal strength. And here's a theory that came out more than 100 years ago which related to when thermic fluids would generate a vortex as opposed to just shimmer up. Notice the only force in there is the force of gravity, G. Everything else is just properties of the fluid and temperatures within it and lengths. And this is where our calculation, basic calculation of cloud base and thermal strength comes from. 
But bear in mind that the air needs to move at around two knots to generate a vortex and therefore a one knot thermal per se does not exist as a vortex. It's only rising air. And often you'll find a very weak thermal that you try and centre on, you can't because actually there is no centre. And for the geeks who want to do the mathematics, there you go. Of course the problem is that this is for an ideal liquid, i.e. it's got constant humidity or constant dryness. The reality is we get a variation in humidity into dry air. So because we were talking about a mixture in the air, not a constant fluid. And there's no account taken for the surface wind and generating triggers as well. Summary and friction then. The reason for this is if you think about solids, if we're trying to move something, it takes more force to get it going, but once it's going, we need less force to keep shoving it along. And that's what happens with the air. Once we've got the air moving at an adequate speed, the vortex will self-sustain for quite a while. But it needs that oomph to get it off the ground and into the vortex. Liquids displaced, they're pushed out of the way. Gases they're pushed out but also there's compression and there's also a boundary layer where we get friction and viscosity. So airspeed physics and Reynolds number and railing. Less than three knots we'll get buoyancy but there's no pressure friction so there's no vortex. Drag of the vortex is around two knots. So three plus knots vortex develops in buoyant flows. Now these are approximate figures, they're not exact, but they're near enough for government work for us. The surface wind, eight knots plus, that generates turbulent flows, increases thermal generation of both humidity and temperature conduction from the ground into the air. It's important then for these weak thermals that don't have a vortex, that there's no outwards gust. There is no vortex outward gust. So it's very important to note that when it's weak it does not have the physics to generate a vortex. Therefore there will be no airspeed gust during the investigative route flown searching despite the fact that the glider has achieved a slow rate of climb for at least six seconds either in a straight line or a gentle thermal. So your real pointer of your weak thermal as to whether you're looking for a vortex or not is fluctuations on the airspeed indicator. If it fluctuates, there may be, a, may be a vortex there. If it doesn't, there certainly isn't a vortex. The four key thermal structures then. The strong bubble with the deep toroidal. There is a limit to how deep this toroid can be. The weak bubble has a shallow toroid but it's going to have the same width. The non-bubble, less than one knot, two knots of air mass flow, no toroidal vortex. And finally the column. The vortex is relative to the air it is moving through and the column of air itself is rising driven up by surrounding sinking air. And we'll have a look at more of the, vo the column in a moment. So here's the column. The column is generated by sinking air, sinking cold air from the evaporated cloud. So if there's no cloud, there's no columns. Tall clouds produce stronger columns. And what's happening is the cold air is coming down, that's the red arrows, and as a result, the air around it is forced up. Just the same way as I showed in the balloon experiment in the car, the heavy air goes one way, the light air must go the other. Now because it's a cylinder, a tube of air coming down, not necessarily all the way to ground level at all, uh, the air within it recognises that it's a bit cold out there, it's surrounded by cold air, so it has buoyancy and it will go up. Within that, 
water seas can generate from humid or hot air coming from underneath the tube and therefore we end up with a relative mov movement of the air it's moving through. So the vortex relative to the air it is moving through, if the vertical wind is two knots, the thermals within the column will give a four knot climb, although they're only climbing at two knots within the column. Motion of a tank track then. Motion relative to the tank, stationary to the ground, assuming no slippage. So we'll just take a few bits out and we'll rotate it this way. So there's our tank track going around quite happily. And notice to the arrow that's pointing to the left, there is no relative movement to the ground. So in this case, it's going to be the air and there's no relative movement to the air next to it. In other words, there is no drag there. If we park one on the other side now, we can see that we've got the formation of a vortex and it's got minimal drag because the air on the outside edges is only tracking at the same speed as the air adjacent to it in the environment. So let's have a look why this is working. Surface friction drag. Considering our bicycle wheel on the left again, if we try and drag it, it has enormous drag. But if we roll it, well, lo and behold, it moves much more freely and would continue to go for a long way for very little force. So a lot of friction, very little friction. And this is what we're doing with our air. It's a three-dimensional or two-dimensional gyro, but the outside edges are not interfering with the airflow to the side of it. And so the air is wheeling itself upwards. Of course, if this air coming down is even colder and starts accelerating downwards, that actually accelerates the rotation of the air within the vortex. When we look at the air motion in a vortex then, why is there no drag in it? Well, there's a laminar flow in the rotation, as there is in this coffee cup, we'll say. <clears throat> and all of the flow is going at the same speed, but that which is further away is rotating slower. So its angular rate of rotation is considerably slower than that that's in the middle. But all of that water or air is all moving at the same rate. So here we have the two vortices going around and there'll be a central surge. Now that will be going up very rapidly because it's well protected from temperatures from the outside and also it will remain humid. So we get a central surge going up rather akin to that. Of course we can play with a toy and have a look at that. We'll have a look at that in a visual aid in a video. We pull the diagram back and let go on our toy and lo and behold we can send a smoke ring effectively at very high speed very long distances and we can then see how the air travels within a vortex and continues to travel. Of course this is the essential shape of the vortex generator on the left but it's also seen in the natural world as cumulus clouds and we see this all the time punching the center of the cloud higher for the most part the center of the cloud higher anyway and cumulus we can also get a bit of cloud suck as a result of that of course a bit like squeezing a toothpaste tube then if we the vortex is already moving it may then accelerate and if it does we need to hang on because we'll get a sudden increase in rate of climb It'll be very smooth, but very small. And we need to hang on to that until it reforms the vortex a little bit higher. So we might have to hang on for three or 400 feet to make sure we don't get left behind. When we consider 
climbing in our thermal. We often see a picture of, or diagram of, it being described as a bubble. And that can give a misleading interpretation, understanding of how, in fact, the air moves. If, for example, it moved as a hot air balloon, maybe like this balloon here, well, I'm going to hit this towards the camera, and you'll see it quickly stops. So if we look from the side, then, you'll see that it not only stops, but then starts to fall. But it falls very slowly, despite its effective density. If we were to consider, at the moment that I have a snowball in my hand, and I throw it to you, obviously it would reach you. Well, it would go quite a long way. And if I throw it hard, it will go much further. If I have now an air ball in my hand, and I try and throw air at you, nothing happens. You won't feel a thing. You might argue, it's not big enough, so let's have a bucket of air then. And again, if this was water, I'd soak you. But it's air. And as I throw the air at you from the bucket, nothing happens. The air is not allowed to move in that way. So the question is, how does the air travel so fast with so little buoyancy? And to help demonstrate that, I'm going to show you a toy. It's a vortex generator toy. And what happens is the air accelerates through here and it generates effectively a smoke ring, a toroidal vortex. We draw the chamber back, at, back here and we make a vortex ring. Of course, because this is to the camera, you can't feel it and you can't see it. So I'm going to introduce smoke in the vortex so you can see it in action. Now we see the vortex from the side. In that smoke ring that you've just seen, you will see that as the rotation slowed to below Rayleigh's number, the vortex completely collapsed. Okay, it's important to note that this is the trigger action which determines how fast the vortex will go. Therefore, in the real world, the more effective, more powerful the trigger action, the stronger the thermal. On the second is that although this vortex keeps going, there's no buoyancy driving it, it's pure momentum. In the real world of thermals, buoyancy is continually driving the vortex. On this one, you'll see as soon as the vortex touches the side, it will break apart. The other aspect is that the vortex doesn't grow in size at all. There is no entrainment into the vortex. It doesn't pick up anything as it goes along. So the thermal will not pick up air from around it. And even more so because it's more dense and so it can't lift it. You'll notice from that demonstration that most of the smoke remains within the vortex and is carried on. And there's only a little bit which trails behind. Again, in the real world, that won't happen, or nowhere near as much, because all of the molecules 
within the vortex have got buoyancy either through temperature or because of a higher humidity within the vortex. So a summary then. We had a look at very simple cloud structures, although we'll look at more at that later. We've seen the P-flow experiments, the importance of Rayleigh number, the misleading one knot thermal, it doesn't exist. We'll have a look at the vortex toy through the video, weak average and strong thermal differences, and the structure of column thermal.